Well, we're going to be talking over the next few weeks about a topic I'm calling God and country. God and country. And to start with, I kind of went back and forth on which scripture to start as my basis scripture, and I settled on Deuteronomy 28, 8 and 9, and I'm going to have Elder Frank read that for us this morning. The Lord will command the blessings on you in your storehouses and in all to which you set your hand, and he will bless you in the land which the Lord your God is giving you. The Lord will establish you as a holy people to himself, just as he has sworn to you if you keep the commandments of the Lord your God and walk in his ways. Father, we thank you. We thank you that even though this was meant for the nation of Israel, it's a picture of the United States of America. We thank you, Lord, that your hand is upon this nation. That in this land, Lord, that your blessings have flown. Not only have they flowed out to the people of the United States, but they've touched every corner of the globe. Every nation continues to feel the benefits and the weight of, of the generosity, of the calling that you have put upon this nation. I continue to pray, and we continue to stand and believe, Lord, that you will continue to, to reach the, the world, that you will continue to bring in the harvest, and that you will continue to receive the glory and honor because of this great nation. We thank you for it in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. We hold these truths to be self-evident. That all men were created equal. That they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. Among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We're going to be talking about several biblical topics over the next few weeks. Some of these topics may offend some. But it won't be me who is offending. It'll be the person who receives it with an offensive heart. Because remember, we're supposed to be people who walk in love, which means we're like a Teflon skillet. When offenses come, they just roll off us, and we continue to love. We continue to walk in love. But some may be offended. Some of the things we talk about may be very personal. And topics that may have been limited off basis for the church, some of them may hit very close to home. For the most part, I'll speak in generalities with some exceptions. Some exceptions that may point to very specifics in our current society. I'll address these in love with biblical and historical truth. Okay, that's my disclaimer. In the United States of America, you do not have a right to not be offended. In fact, is in good biblical and political discourse, there is opportunity to be offended. But you know what we're not supposed to do is we're not supposed to develop walls between each other because of our differences of opinion and thought and understanding, especially of, of histories. But I believe that there is a tide that has, has started to turn in this last generation where many people feel that if you do not agree with them, you're offensive and should be silenced. And I don't believe this is good discord, whether it's biblical or political. Because let's remember, most political discord in our modern day, our modern society, is actually has crossed over into the biblical realm. And because they've labeled it political, they want the church to shut up and be quiet about it. But this isn't a new idea. Speaking in generalities, we can all go all the way back into the 1400s and find this same type of discourse. 
I mean, you think about somebody like Galileo who, who dared to say that the earth was round and was thrown into prison. So again, we need to be willing to have conversations. And I think that's what I want to do today. But today is going to be more of an overview and some history. History as it happened. History as it is documented, not selectively extracted for one's political or ideological benefit. Because there's a lot of that going on around today. I want to teach you without basis for establishing any particular leaning. Now, obviously, I believe wholeheartedly that this is the Word of God, that it's infallible. It means it'll, you'll never get fouled up if you read it. It's never wrong. God doesn't change. So I believe this is the basis for which all of our conversations start. This is our, our doctrine. This is our established truth for which our basis start. Because with, without this, without a basis for establishing our relationship for God and country, everything else is just pure speculation, pure wish, pure, pure hope, or maybe some pure belief. But for centuries, this is and was the foundational history book, the foundational basis for which this nation was established. And we will see that over the next few weeks. You know, as I start to talk about some of these things and talk about the forming of our nation, our relationship of, of, of God and how he, that relationship works with our country, you know, we actually, for the Americas, have to go all the way back to 1492 when Columbus landed in the Bahamas, finding a new trade route to Asia. I think he failed by a couple continents. But when he landed in the Bahamas, now Columbus was not the first to settle North America. Hundreds of years or centuries before, Greenland had been settled, which is part of England, Greenland in the Newfoundland area. Uh, in northwest Canada, but when Columbus hit the Bahamas, it really began a, or opened up an exchange as Spain was interested in greater exploration, but along with other, the Dutch, the, the English, and many other countries that now found their pathways this way. So really, we can go back to 1492 and look at the formation of the, ide of the ideas that brought about this nation. In 1513, Florida was founded by De Leon. De Leon founded the Carolinas in 1526, and Cabrillo founded California in 1542. The English settled in Jamestown, Virginia in 1607, and the English pilgrims landed in Plymouth, Massachusetts in 1620. But the colonies actually begot their establishment. The 13 colonies from which our states united got their first beginning in 1607 in Jamestown, Virginia. But really, Walter Raleigh had found Virginia in 1587, but hadn't gotten approval to establish colonization by England. And then Massachusetts in 1620, New York in 1626, and on and on, with Georgia being the final of the 13 colonies in 1732. These colonies became states, and the states united by a constitution. For me, the understanding of how this country was formed happened over time, and maybe for you, the same. For me, it was like fifth and sixth grade is really when it started. There was a, a guy who was running for re-election named Gerald Ford. You remember him? Gerald Ford has an interesting history about him. Do you know that he's the only president of the United States to never run for office? 
He was a congressman from Connecticut, where you're born. He was elected Speaker of the House. Richard Nixon's vice president had to resign, and Gerald Ford was appointed vice president. And then in 1972, Nixon stepped down, and Gerald Ford became president. He became president without ever running for office. He was elected just as a congressman. But why would my, my journey start there? Well, I think in fifth and sixth grade, the, probably the classes started talking a little bit more about, about history. But, but for me, really, the deal was one of my best friend's name was Gerald. Now, my, my family are a long, long line of Democrats. And uh, my gr grandpa was a teamster, and the, and the family grew up. They were Kennedy Democrats. You know, John F. Kennedy, I don't think, could get elected today on his platform that he ran in in 1964. But my family were, were Democrats, and so my, my family was uh, supporting Jimmy Carter for the election against Gerald Ford. But me, I had a friend named Gerald, so I was a Gerald Ford fan. And I remember that election, but I remember what the next four years of the economic downturn did to my family. We were already broke. Can you be broker? I mean, if you can, we were. I mean, high inflation. For some of you have never seen home interest rates at 14, 16, and 18 percent. When I was a kid, that's what they were. My parents lived through it. And then come to the election of 1980. By that time, you know, I was a little bit older. And um, I wasn't living where Gerald did anymore. And so when Jimmy Carter was running against Ronald Reagan, I was a Jimmy Carter fan. Well, of course I'm a Jimmy Carter fan because my whole family said Reagan's a warmonger and we're going to be in World War III. It'll be the end of the America the way we know it. All politics will end if Reagan is elected. Anybody heard those words lately? But, you know, as a young person, I believe what my parents said. Because if anybody knows anything, they know something, right? They're feeding me. They must know how this works. But in 1980, um, Ronald Reagan beat Jimmy Carter and started us on economic renewal in this country. And really, I, I, was, I was just months too young to vote in the... 1984 presidential race where Ronald Reagan basically swept the entire country because we went from 14, 16, and 18 percent interest rates to interest rates that were uh, maybe 10, sometimes single digits, but people could at least afford again. People had jobs again. And it was during this time that my mom actually got a good job. And I wasn't in a position to, to vote in 84. But in 1988, I had an opportunity to, to vote. But it, in, in the state we're from, Washington State, they do this thing called caucusing. Anybody ever been involved with a caucus? It's a little bit different. It's a whole lot more intimidating. Okay, so all elections were used to be like this. You come together in this big room. Everybody talks about their candidate and why they, they think they should be elected. And then everybody votes in the open. So everybody there knows exactly where you stand, who you're voting for. And at this time, in 1988, uh, George H.W. Bush, George Herbert Walker Bush, George Bush II's dad was running for president against somebody named Pat Robertson. If you don't know Pat Robertson, he was one of the founders of the 700 Club. And he was talking about something that I hadn't heard politicians talk about Reagan protected, but Pat Robertson was talking about the importance of America, its history, and us as a Christian nation. And as a young man uh, who was in the process of coming to, to know Jesus Christ in my, my junior high and high school time periods, one of my favorite people to watch and listen to was a guy named Ben Kinchlow. Anybody remember that name? He was one of the people on the 700 Club. Well, in 1988, I got in, involved in politics, went to the caucus, supported Pat Robertson, 
and was elected as a delegate to the convention. And I got a really interesting education on how politics works. It is messy. It is very messy. And it's very intimidating. But our founding fathers saw this as being a good way of making sure to weed out unsuspecting sheep in wolves' clothing. Or is it the other way around? Wolves in sheep's clothing. Yeah, I think it is. Um, I hope I'm not being judged on my examples this morning. Praise the Lord. Uh, too late. <laughs> like Pastor Art Aragon says, he says, every Sunday's an election. You know, people vote whether they're coming back next week or not. Amen. Um, but it was a very interesting process. What, and, and actually, the caucus process is one of the reasons why they, they turned the pl preliminary elections or the primary elections for candidates into straight elections, is so that it would take away that factor of intimidation. And now they're trying to do these ranked choice voting, which I think is completely insane, because if we have two people that believe in something that is a values based and somebody one person running who believes in non-value based stances these two will split the vote in ranked choice and they may get together more votes than the person that neither of the people who voted for these people would get and this person will win the election it is insanity but our society is in the crosshairs so i started to learn about the constitution as I walked through the process myself. And it really became, I mean, it really became illuminating to me. In fact, it's so much so, it makes me wonder why I didn't pay more attention when I was in high school. I mean, how many remember when you walked into history class and they gave you a book this big? Okay? But that was for the six-month class. And then the next six months, they gave you another book this big. And they did that all four years in high school. You had to know the, the Washington, because I was from Washington State, you had to know Washington State history. You had to know U.S. history. You had to know world history. I'm just like, it was so boring. Why do I care what Marie Antoinette did? You know, I mean, that was my thought when I was in high school. It was so uninteresting to me. But when I got out of high school and started getting engaged in how this country was formed, our responsibilities as citizens to be involved and engaged in the political process started to, to come to light. And I started to, to, as a believer, started to want to find out how God played a role in our country. Proverbs 29, 2 says, When the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. See, this speaks volumes that when the righteous are in authority, people rejoice because things are good. There's opportunity. There's freedom. There's this thing that we used to talk about all the time called liberty. The right to self-govern. Because remember, and we'll talk more about this, in the constitutional republic that we live in. We do not live in a democracy. When you hear that nonsense, you've got to slap it down. It's coming out of our education system now. We live in a constitutional republic. And in a constitutional republic, the authority, the power, lies with the citizens. Literally, each person who hears my voice and lives in the United States and is a citizen of the United States is literally a king in this country. We are the kings in the United States of America. Now, I don't know where you are at with all the sovereign stuff that happens over in England. You know, the king this, the queen this, the, the duchess this. I mean, they've got hours of shows on American television about how much money that the royals in, in, in the British rule are wasting when it could be spent on other things. And why in the world the Americans are so enthralled and so interested in this 
when we fought a revolution to remove monarchies from our way of life and from our society, and I hear people say things like, oh, wouldn't it be so cool if we had that? No! We rose up because of the tyranny that goes with it. It's totalitarian in nature. It's based simply upon whom you happen to be born to. Has nothing to do with the content or quality of your character. Doesn't have anything to do with the person that you are. When the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. The story and formation of our states united is nothing short than God ordained. Not far from the formation of the nation of Israel. If you look at the nation of Israel and its formation, you can go back and find very much similarities between how the United States of America was formed and the values for which it was formed and the fights in which we fight of similarity and how this nation has had God's provincial hand on it because it is divinely ordered. There's a guy named John Locke. I don't know if you've ever heard the name John Locke before, but hopefully if you've ever studied history, you've seen his, his name. John Locke was a theologian that lived from 1632 to 1704. Well, why is it important what happened with a theologian that lived between 1632 and 1704? John Locke is probably one of the most important writers of the framework of the United States Constitution, and yet he lived and, and passed away 75 years before our Constitution was ever ratified. Locke is one of the most important but largely unknown names in American history today. A celebrated English philosopher, educator, government official, and theologian. It is not an exaggeration to say that without his substantial influence on American thinking, there might well be no United States today. Or at the very least, America certainly would not exist with the same level of rights, stability of government, and quality of life that we have enjoyed well over two centuries. President Ronald Reagan Confirmed when he said, America testifies to the power and the vision of free men inspired by the ideals and dedication to liberty of John Locke. In 1696, John Locke published two books, The Two Treaties of Government. Now, not two treaties, like between nation treaties, that means a position. It was his positional writing about what government should be. In fact, as I have the combined volumes here, and I would like to read from the pages. I've actually given the, um, the pages I'm going to read to be put up on the overhead so that you can follow along. It says, to understand political power right... And derive it from its original, we must consider what state all men are naturally in. And that is a state of perfect freedom to order their actions and dispose of their possessions and persons as they think fit within the bounds of the law of nature without asking leave or depending upon the will of any other man. Now remember John Locke. John Locke was living under a monarchy, under the crown of England. He goes on to write in this next paragraph, a state also of equality, wherein all power and jurisdiction is reciprocal, no one having more than another, there being nothing more evident than that creatures of the same species and rake, promiscuously born to all the same advantage in nature, and to use the same faculties should also be equal, one amongst another, without subrogation or subjection. This kind of thought 
could get a man killed in a monarchy. And yet he published this, and our founding fathers not only read it, they were educated in this in the colonial schools, and they drew from it when they wrote the Constitution of the United States, and Jefferson used this as his framework for the, our declaration of separation from England. In addition to this position on biblical governments, ministers were also bringing biblical inspiration for a Christian ethic in government. And we're going to be talking about some of the ministers in the late 1600s and the early 1700s before we ever declared separation from England. Guys like John Witherspoon, George Whitfield, and Lemuel Hayes. He's an inspiring, Lemuel Hayes is an inspiring minister of the gospel. And when we talk about him in the coming weeks, you'll see why. Because he breaks, and I'm just going to, this, he breaks a lot of the stereo typical stories that people try to say that our country was formed upon. At Valor Christian Center, we certainly acknowledge the divine origins of these United States. We honor those who have served. We commemorate those who have given their full measure of devotion. We respect our flag and our country. It represents us as one nation under God, and we recognize that though not perfect, we will ever strive to honor God, love others, and fulfill our call. Even though America hasn't done everything right every single time and at every turn, we are good at fixing our problems and continuing to be some nation's manifest destinies. So let me read this as our time is slipping from us. In Congress, July 4th, 1776, the unanimous declaration of the 13 United States of America, when in the course of human events it becomes necessary for a people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them to another and to assume among them powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and nature's God entitle them. A decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impale them to separation. See, our founding fathers relied upon laws of nature and nature's God speaking purely of Jehovah. And as we look at some of the quotes of the founding fathers, even some of the founding fathers that they now claim were atheists and secularists, their quotes about the relationship they had with God, that the country had with God, that, that our destiny had with God, will certainly diminish and eradicate some of these false teachings, these false histories, these false beliefs that are now circulating and starting to permeate our educational system. If you don't think these words that initiate our Declaration of Independence are biblical, you can look as far as Genesis chapter 11, verses 31 and 32, and Genesis chapter 12, 1 through 3. In Genesis chapter 11, verse 1, God speaks, or in 31, God speaks to a man named Terah. Now, if you may not, that may, may not be familiar with you, to you, he is actually the one that God called to go to Canaan and establish his people as a nation. Who was Terah? He was Abraham's father. When Abraham and his father were living in the land of the Chaldeans, God called Terah to take his son and to take his nephew and go to Haran and to stay there for a time and then go to Canaan. But when he encamped there, when he refused to leave because of his uh, brother's uh, establishment there in Haran, God spoke to Abraham and called him and said, Abraham, I'm calling you to the land that you don't know anything about. I'm calling you to go and establish my people. And in chapter 12 of Genesis, and he says, and I will be with you. And anyone who blesses you, I will bless. And anyone who curses you, I will curse. 
And God called Abraham and he went to the land that he knew not of into a people he had no relationship with and established what became the nation of Israel. Through Abraham became Isaac and through Isaac became Jacob and God changed Jacob's name to Israel and Israel had 12 sons and the 12 sons became the 12 tribes. Our constitution, our declaration are all based upon these biblical facts. So over the next few weeks, we're going to talk about these two ideologies. What is an ideology? An ideology is a manner or con content of thinking, characteristics of an individual group or culture, a systematic body of concepts, especially about human life or culture. We're going to talk about two different ideologies. We're going to talk about a biblical ideology. That's where our beliefs are based upon the Bible. And then we're going to talk about a secular ideology. An ideology over here that is built upon humanism. Built upon the flesh. Built upon what's in it for me. Built upon what makes me feel good. Based upon uh, it's okay because I think it's okay. And I have learned that whatever I do is okay. And it's the evil spirit that's behind new math. It's the evil spirit behind new language. It's the evil spirit of, along new societal thinking. Because it's meant to destroy a culture. It's meant to destroy a people. It's meant to destroy the biblical ideology for which this nation was founded. The church is supposed to be in the world. But we are not supposed to be like the world. Elder Frank, would you read John 15, 19? If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. This was what Jesus said. Jesus said, look, the world isn't going to like you. And you've heard me say it before. Who cares what other people think about you? They don't like you anyways. And they spend very little time thinking about you. You spend more time thinking about what people think about you than they actually do thinking about you. So just forget it. This, this is a quote. The general principles on which the fathers achieved independence were the general principles of Christianity. I will avow that I then believed, and I now believe that those general principles of Christianity are eternal and immutable as the existence and attributes of God. John Adams, signer of the Declaration of Independence, judge, diplomat, and one of the two signers of the Bill of Rights, and the second president of the United States. And now one of the people that the secularists are trying to say did not believe in God. I disagree with those people who think that the church has no natural or national interest in what happens in our country. I disagree with that. I believe God is intimately concerned with what happens in the United States. No country has sent more missionaries into the world. No country has sent more humanitarian aid into the world. No country has done more on, for the environment, for people's rights, and for equality than the United States of America. And they want to destroy this country. They want to pluralize this country. They want to devalue the Bible in this country, and make it just like every other place in the world. It was by divine providence that the United States of America was formed. I want to read something and close with this. It's from, it's from Renew a Nation. And I read it about, I don't know, four or six years ago here, but I want to read it again. It says, American history is filled with instances of God's supernatural intervention in important events. In the colonial era, this includes among myriads of examples, Pocahontas providing, providentially saving John Smith's life, 
God sending Squanto to help the pilgrims survive in their new home. William Penn receiving a charter through my God to start a new colony. The miraculous defeat of the French fleet sent to destroy America in 1746. The great outpouring of God's Spirit during the first great awakening. And God's preserving Washington's life during the French and Indian Wars. God's providence continued during the American Revolution and was acknowledged by all. In reviewing the events of the first few years of the Revolutionary War, George Washington wrote in 1778, the hand of providence has been so conspicuous in all of this. Amen? Amen.